There it is. Here we are. Another Friday Night Live. I am so excited to be back with you guys. And I'm also excited because I'm joined by one of my favorite guests that I've ever had on the podcast and that I will probably ever have on the podcast. And hopefully he comes back many, many more times. He's already come back. This will be your your fourth time, right? Third or fourth time on the podcast. More than two. Like more, yeah, than more two, than two, more than two. And for Alex Rudd, that's pretty good. I mean, if if a person can stand me for more than two interactions, I must have done something all right. But I am joined again by Mr. John Hammonds. John, how are you, my friend? Doing good. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's probably somewhat uh, my characteristics, too. I, I'd like anytime I have a platform to talk about fish, I'm there. So oh, there you go. I, I'm hooked. No pun intended. <laughs> there you go. I love it. No, full, full pun intended. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. I, I love having John on because John is a, uh, is a very smart individual to say the least. And I, you know, I don't think, I think the first time we ever got together, I'll let you describe what you do. And then after that, it was just like, we got straight into the fish talk, but if you will tell everybody kind of what you do for the TWA and like what your profession is, if you w- wouldn't mind. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm, my title, I guess, is a, is a fisheries biologist and, and more mm-hmm. specifically a reservoir fisheries biologist. So our agency has folks that, that concentrate on stream stuff and then also reservoir stuff. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, it's, it's similar to how we manage wildlife. It's, uh, you know, you manage their habitat, but we have folks that are specialists with deer and specialists with turkey and bear and so forth mm-hmm. and so on. But there's too many fish out there to specialize in. So we just divided up into streams and, and reservoirs um so my job specifically is we i'm, I'm i oversee the data collection uh, the krill surveys and the fish habitat enhancement in the region four reservoir systems there's there's about um 11 main reservoirs that we have 13 all together but 11 kind of we do most of the work on it goes from norris you know kind of south loud and telco all the way up to wataga which is in uh, you know, near Mountain City, so the mm-hmm. whole eastern part of the state. And uh, within our work group, we have a couple of managers that do all the data collection, like electric fishing, you know, trap netting, all the stuff that you would want to do to try to keep task of your different sport fish that people you know, go after. And then we have our crew clerks. Uh, they're the, the guys that, the guys and gals that interview you as an angler and ask you questions about how many you've caught, how long you've been fishing, how much money mm-hmm. have you spent, all that stuff. And mm-hmm. We use that, and does the federal government use that to determine, um, well, it helps them determine how much money that uh, that they give us back from the license sales and uh, also the excise tax that are on, like if you buy a fishing rod or a, a lure, you know, I think I've explained that before. Uh, and then our fish habitat program, we have a couple guys full-time in that, um, in that crew, and, and their job is mainly to make construct however you want to say it uh, and place the pulley fish habitat and a lot of that's done with you know specialized equipment we use cedar trees sometimes because we've been making these concrete structures called reef balls and there's actually some videos out there of us doing that on our uh, i think it's on our facebook page the agency's facebook page and people can get to it there maybe on the youtube i'm not for sure but anyway it's out there if you search it you can find it pretty neat yeah yeah we uh me and bethany went and walked the banks of norris the other day and we were talking about the reef balls because i guess the water wasn't down far enough last time and she had never seen one and she was like what is that and i was like it's reef yeah. balls it's artificial yeah. artificial fish habitat and i was like she's like oh that's pretty cool and i'm like yeah it is pretty cool yeah. but no that's <laughs> that's awesome man uh you know it's that's one thing i think a lot of people and just kind of get a, already getting off on a tangent lord of mercy but um <laughs> I think some people don't understand is like, you know, when you buy fishing license, when you buy fishing equipment, you know, obviously your fishing license, that's, that's direct back into, to conservation and, and helping you guys out. And then the excise tax on fishing equipment and on the other hand, like ammunition and guns, when you're talking about hunting, but you know, specifically our fishing equipment, whatever it is that we buy, you know, there's a small percentage that goes back to you guys as well to help yeah. maintain fisheries and all that kind of stuff. Um, one question I do have just kind of popped in my head is is like when you're in the just current state of things, and I I don't mean this in a political way. I just mean that in just in the current state that we're in, um, as far as like money and everything that's happening, is there, do you guys see like ebbs and flows in, you know, 
do you is there been years where you guys have a surplus of money to spend and to use and then there's there are years where you're scraping by or it's like how does that work it's just like a random question that kind of popped in my head yeah that, that's a good question and so it, i guess the way to say it is like you know our, our budgets our specific budgets we operate out of they don't change a whole lot mm-hmm. but when we do have surplus money it allows us to buy equipment you know, whether it's boats, um, you know, some kind of specialized like a tractor or something like that. That's where we, we, we get to use that surplus. Our budgets are, uh, you know, pretty stable from year to year. Sometimes they go up and down, just depends on different things. But but to answer your question, the, the, when COVID hit and pretty much the country shut down, well, people either remodeled their house or they went fishing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, our our license sales and we, it was a nationwide trend really grew. And yeah. I would, I would not want to give you a certain percent cause I, I don't remember, but it's, it was pretty significant, you know, to the yeah. tune of it, it increased our of course total uh, agency budget, you know, in the, in the millions. So mm-hmm. it was a whole lot. And uh, by the time, you know, it trickles down to every, you know, group out there doing work for, for mm-hmm. wildlife, it's not a whole lot of money, but like I say, we were able to get some, you know, different types of equipment. And that sort of thing. So yeah, it, you you see that. Um, yeah. You know, sadly enough, though, the the trend has been kind of a downward trend. But there's some groups out there that's kind of studied this, and um, one of the states, I think Arizona, was the first one to implement. It's called R3 reactivation, um, and and of course, I would forget what they stood for. But anyway, it's basically recruiting people. Uh, if you've never went fishing, and if you have been fishing, well, let's go again, and then. Uh, if you are fishing, let's keep you fishing. So reactivation, gotcha. recruitment, and, and retention. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, but they implemented this program, and they saw an increase in our license sales before COVID. So mm-hmm. a lot of states are going going to this, and, and you know, there's programs that we've done all along, but it's more focused on that. So, so yeah, there's ebbs and flows like you described. A lot of there was a nationwide downward trend in it, especially the hunting end, but fishing seems to be doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think I was, I, what made me curious about that is I was listening to meat eater podcasts and they were kind of talking about in Colorado specifically, it was like you said, the hunting was trending down again. And they just believed that a lot of it had to do with, whereas like fishing is more year round, depending on where mm-hmm. you're at in the country, you know, there's no, mm-hmm. depending on where you're at, you know, some States have seasons or whatever, you know, down South, most places don't, but they were talking about how hunting has seasons. It's like, with so many different inputs that people have into their lives, whether it's mm-hmm. football, basketball, hunting, you know, that people mm-hmm. just like, just like people trend on things. Mm-hmm. Hunting was a trend during mm-hmm. COVID because everybody wanted outside. And now it's not as much as a trend anymore because mm-hmm. it's just not as much of a concern to mm-hmm. try to go find something to do. You know what I mean? Sure. But now I was just, I, I, when you started talking about excise tax and all that kind of got me, thinking and there you go there's our first rabbit hole for today i mean you know right off we're not even eight minutes into this thing we've already had a rabbit hole but we are here to talk about what kills fish and i guess you know obviously most of everything that we talk about on here is bass fishing so we're going to talk about what kills bass but what kills fish in general too and so i kind of want to just start wading right into the topic and really start kind of dissecting from you know from your point of view and from you know data collected and what you've seen in your career what kills fish in three different ways and we talked about this before we got on here the first one i want to talk about is in nature you know like what in a bass's natural habitat their natural life just their existence kills them Mm -hmm. um the second be like diseases and things that we have to worry about um, one in particular being that largemouth bass virus. I don't want to kind of dive into that a little bit because I've seen, I've had experience with that. Um, and I've seen it not here in this state, but in another state, destroy a lake. And then number three, I want to talk about humans and how we've kind of jacked it up and how we jack fish up. So yeah, but like, first of all, like in nature, what is the most prevalent predator in a bass's existence? And I know this, that's a very broad brush question because, you know, you have lakes that have muskies in them. So you got predators in the water with them. And then you've got other lakes where they're the apex predator. Mm-hmm. Um, but like in your guys kind of, I don't know, in your experience or in data collected or whatever, if, if you know this, what in a bass's life kills it the most? 
Well, you know, it, that's a good question. And, and um, it's actually really hard to put your thumb on that and say, mm -hmm. what is it? And so d d this kind of directly answer that question, you know, it would be other fish or birds, mm -hmm. but if it's an adult bass, obviously there's not going to be many fish to eat it. But if it's a young bass, there's a lot, even bluegill, you know, you name it, crappie, they can eat it. Um, so, you know, other fish and then just, 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 uh, you know, any sort of natural mortality like that, uh, you know, like even in the human population, you know, it, mm -hmm. you, everybody doesn't grow up and to be old. So you're just going to die of any kind of cause, whether like you were saying, a virus or illness, some kind of infection or just a birth defect. There's a lot of different things that, that you know, that cause them to die. And that's why they have, you know, hundreds of thousands of eggs and literally mm -hmm. a tiny 1% of that, you know, makes it to adult. So yeah. that's their strategy to put a lot of fish out there in hopes that a few make it. Yeah. So yeah. other, you know, predation mostly would be the, I mean, it would be by far the, the, the most common thing, but it depends on what stage of their life, you know, when they get eaten. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously when they're little, you know, just like fry and a little bit mm -hmm. bigger, it's going to be pretty much anything else in a lake. It's got a, a yes. big enough mouth to get it in yes. there. It's going to kill it. Yes. And then when they get a little bit older, you're talking about, it's going to have to be something big and predatory, like a bird and something, yes. you know, there are, you know, I don't know, some other animal come walking along. But I see, I seen a raccoon carrying a bass around one day. I thought that was pretty fascinating. But yeah, I, I always wondered when I saw that, I was like, I wonder how that went down. Like, yeah. was he swimming along the bank and he grabbed him or what happened? <laughs> but no, it, it, what made me kind of go on that question is I was listening to something and they were talking, I was fascinated by this because it's turkey season. Yeah. And so they're talking about turkeys and they were talking about how they did a study where turkeys, the number one predator that killed a turkey was owls. And that they would hit them while they were gobbling in the trees. Yeah. Like that a turkey gobbling in a tree would attract the owls and the owls would kill them. And that like in this study, the number one predator was was an yeah. owl. And I was like, that's really fascinating. So I yeah. didn't know if you had some like, it, you know, would thing with bass be like, well, if you didn't know, there's Sasquatches walking around just jerking <laughs> yeah. them out of the water left and right. I didn't know. <laughs> But no, that's kind of where that yeah. question come from. Okay. But yeah, no, that's that, that's fascinating. I mean, you know, because you look at, you know, just bass fishing as much as I as I have, you know, every now and again, like I'll see an otter, you know, he'll have a bass in his mouth. You know, that's that fascinates me, you know, or you'll see um, like a blue herring. I've seen them, you know, 12 inch bass get them before. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's above the water kind of what you see. But then mm -hmm. under the water, I didn't know if there was – do do rockfish and, like, other big predatory fish, are they pretty hard on larger bass, like in that one, two, three-pound range? Or do they kind of leave them alone in your guys' experience, or have you seen? Well, now, I've never personally done those those uh, food and or stomach analysis um, – studies but anyone i've ever read or any, anything anybody's ever done is if you kind of look at it this way so striped bass um they live out in the middle of the lake mm -hmm. and large mouth don't now small mouth will typically be swimming with them mm -hmm. um especially when the alwives you know arrived and, and made their their presence known yeah. uh and, and you know a lot of people catch them suspended and all that stuff so they're out there with them, but it's it's usually the bigger fish that can avoid predation by that. So the other thing about fish's nature is they're going to eat whatever's in front of them that's easiest. So mm -hmm. no doubt a striper has eaten a bass in its lifetime. Mm -hmm. But any any study that's ever been done, even with crappie, um, mm -hmm. you know, as, as one of the feared targets, that 90 whatever percent, the overwhelming majority has been shad. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're higher in calories. There's a lot of nutrients in there and that's where they live, you know, shatter out in the middle. And that's what these stripers target. They're swimming around. They are not structure oriented. So, mm -hmm. so no, it's not really an issue at all. Now there'll be people, you know, fist fight you over that statement. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. You know, and if that's been their experience and that's been their experience, but any kind of research that's ever been done or anything that I've seen or, or talked about with other colleagues has been just that, that no, they're not, it's never an issue as far as affecting their total population. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, only once in my life have I ever seen a striper take a swipe at a bass and I think it was totally accidental and he didn't even eat him. He just killed him. Like yeah. he was shad spawn 
And, you know, these striper were running through these balls of bait and there just happened to be a largemouth there. And I think he just got in his way and like, you know, just whacked him and he rolled yeah. up and he was, he was done for. And I guess that's another one of those scenarios where it's just like, it's like getting hit by a car. Like it's just random. That bass was living a perfectly good life and then just got clapped by a striper and he's dead. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I didn't, th- I didn't think it was an issue. I mean, I've been around a lot of stripers. I've seen striper and largemouth both blown up on shad before. And it's like the stripers are totally unconcerned that they're even there. If anything, the bass are kind of concerned. I've seen some fear out of bass around stripers where are like stripers will clear bass out. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that's just, because something's bigger, you know, and it's kind of self-preservation or what it sure. is. But for the most part, they seem totally unconcerned that either one's there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, fascinating. and stripe, you know, there's a, there's also, a lim- you know, you can look at it another way too, as far as affecting that population. There's a limited amount of food for them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's some evidence that, you know, especially if you, if you have, you know, if you were to stock, way more than we do stripers mm-hmm. you could de- easily affect the bass population but at our level we feel pretty comfortable that it's not got a huge effect on them yeah but the other thing about that is there's i was just at a meeting in the, the southern division meeting which is involved several states tennessee of course and north carolina mm-hmm. south carolina georgia mm-hmm. all up and down the east coast and even out to texas but there were some research that some students were doing that showed the gape width um of the stripers and at what point do they start eating these larger shad mm-hmm. and it was actually at a pretty small um pretty small size compared to their their overall like you know just mm-hmm. right around 17 inches which is not you know it's not a terribly huge stripe bass at all but even yeah. for a large mouth or small mouth you know there's still plenty of growth potential after 17 inches so yeah the, the point of that study was to say you know e- even with that minimal competition these largemouth and smallmouth are not eating these size shads. So basically they're not taking away anything from them at that oh. stage of their life as, as full blown adults. Now as young fish and all that totally different story and different dynamic, but yeah, you know, it's even, even that little bit of competition, it's probably not as much as we think because of that whole scenario of, you know, the stripers pretty much target the larger shad that the bass don't even eat or can't eat. Yeah. That's fascinating. That, that really is fascinating because just thinking on it, you know, I almost never, I'll see a lot of bass school on thread fins, but yeah. very rarely will they school on gizzards, but mm-hmm. they'll eat a gizzard. And like, there's right. instances where there's like a gizzard shad bite, but it's like normally in an area where, you know, they're sitting in the grass and they're just blasting one or two gizzards that come by every right. now and again. Whereas like those strappers will school on the gizzards, like oh, yeah. the largemouth will school on the thread fins. And that's fascinating that you just said that because it just kind of put a connection in my head to things that I've seen on the water. That it's like it's almost like a like a class system. Like you know, these stripers are just going to eat the bigger things because they're yeah. bigger. The bass are going to eat the smaller things because not you know they're not smaller, but just overall form factor. Yeah, compared to a thirty-five or forty-pound rockfish, it's right. not the same even predator level. It's like a house cat and a lion. You know, I mean, yeah. both, both deadly, both deadly yeah. to whatever they're hunting. Yeah. It's just that they're not, one's hunting a Cape Buffalo, the other one's hunting a, a you know, mm-hmm. a fly flying around your house. So that's really fascinating. Now you said something about the Elwives earlier. Is that considered an invasive species in Tennessee or are they natural? They're, they're non-native. Uh, non-native. And, and I get, you know, invasive is like a definition and it's almost like a relative term, but uh, invasive means that it harms other things and, and maybe displaces native fish. So if you look at it like that, it can be, you know, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's not affected our sport fish. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's affected maybe some of the other native fishes. Now, what it has affected by far is walleye. If mm-hmm. you have elwife in there, I, I shouldn't say it affects our sport fish. It hasn't affected smallmouth or largemouth. Gotcha. But um, it's kind of helped them in some cases. But uh, walleye will not reproduce mm-hmm. um, enough to sustain their population if you have elwife in that body of water. That's fascinating. What? So I had somebody like kind of explain. I had one of the um, the guys who collect just like data. The mm-hmm. uh, older man I met anyway. Anywho, I met him on Norris one day, and he went into a whole thing about that. He and he kind of explained to me is it because it makes them sterile? Yeah. Or how's that work? Explain that to me. Yeah, yeah, that was probably one of our krill clerks, and he's been on that reservoir for over 30 years. And What's he, his name? He, his name's Paul Shaw. Paul, that's it. Yes, and he's awesome. I like that dude. He is a good good dude and uh, very 
he's a good uh, agent or whatever you want to say, spokesman for the agency. He, he actually went to Auburn and, uh, and fish people would get it, but he, he knew Homer Swingle, which is like the father of fish management, kind of the stuff that meat and potatoes fish management that we use for predator prey relationships and pond stocking and all that stuff. All that what research. Was, what done. was that guy's name one more time? His name was Homer Swingle. Homer Swingle. I'm going to write that down because I just want yeah. to look into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, Homer he, Swingle. He, he, all that stuff was done like the 40s and 50s, and people just took it and ran with it. And, you know, we have modern day fish management. Um, yeah. But he was at Auburn. But Paul knew that guy. But anyway, so there's been a lot of research done on that too. And, and there's, you can't really pinpoint that. It's more like a trifold effect where the, the mm-hmm. male wife eat the walleye fry. And then when the walleye eat the L wife themselves, it does, it does kind of hinder their reproductive cycle. And, mm-hmm. but you know, the, to dispel that one thing rumor or one thing idea that, you know, we take those fish from Norris and spawn them at Eagle Bend and, and they live just fine. So, mm-hmm. and those L wife have been eaten or those walleye have been eating L wife their whole life. So yeah. they're, you know, it's not just that one thing, but it's a, it's a combination of them all. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. He's, uh, he, he stopped us one day on Norris and was asking us and we ended up having a, we probably stood there for an hour and 20 minutes and just talked about everything under the sun. And it was a fantastic yeah. conversation and he got on the walleye and the whole walleye thing interested me. And, and what was funny is the reason I asked that question is it was a guy who fished the, that Bassmaster open on Cherokee. It said he got on an L wipe bite. And I, I was just, I, I got to thinking about it. I was like, I have, only very rarely experienced Elwife as far as like a bait fish that I'm targeting to try to catch a bass. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he said mm-hmm. the Elwife were spawning on one of the banks that he was fishing on, which I found even more fascinating because I was like, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen an Elwife spawn. Like I've seen <laughs> Threadfin spawn, I've seen Gizzard spawn, but I've never seen Elwife. And I was just wondering if that was just a, so it's a non-native, but not really considered yeah. invasive, like yeah. a snakehead or something would be. Right, right. It's yeah. it's not as dangerous you know, it's it's dangerous to walleye, and, and they've already there. There, there's only one reservoir that we have where they're not already present, and that's Douglas. So mm. the Douglas is the only natural natural reproducing walleye population we have, or at least to somewhat sustain themselves over there. That's really wild. That's really fascinating. That's what it, Paul was telling us too: is that there was only like one or two lakes that that happens that's crazy that is just that's a really so so does it do and i you probably you may not know the answer to this but just thinking about it, i know there's a ton of l wife like in the great lakes mm. does it have the same effect on walleye in the great lakes because i mean there's more walleye in the great lakes and you shake a stick at or is it just the just the vastness of the lake and like the fact that a walleye may have more opportunities outside of l wife to eat than yeah. in a smaller reservoir yeah, I think it's probably that, and uh, they're, they're, you know, they may not be as as many in there because um, threadfin are, you know, they don't like cold water, mm-hmm. and a lot of times they'll die off here, and that was the whole reason they'll offer here to try to fix that situation. But you know, I can imagine that the threadfin hang on and don't let the wife you know, overpopulate, so to speak, in those reservoirs. But I really don't know. No, you're right. I, I don't know for sure, but. No. But uh, it's a different situation for us. If they're here, we we don't have a lot. Yeah, that's really interesting. That is very interesting. All right, there's rabbit hole number two for tonight. I need to have a. <laughs> I need I need to figure out how to implement a rabbit hole counter on like the bottom left hand of the screen and just hit it every time we go off on a tangent. Like, dude, I'm telling you, this podcast is. We just need to call it the Alex Rudd Fishing Rabbit Hole Podcast because it is nothing but rabbit holes every time we get on here. All right, so let's go to what kills bass number two mm-hmm. and diseases viruses Mm -hmm. um plagues i mean like everything Mm -hmm. like everything Mm -hmm. under the sun what Mm -hmm. right now is like the most prevalent thing that can get in a bass population and kill them or is what is something you guys are seeing a lot of whether it may concern you or may not what what is it that does that well now this is going to be one of those questions answers that you're looking for earlier um believe it or not it's it's alabama bass for us uh that once they get into the system in certain types of systems the large mouth are basically uh, pushed to the upper ends of the creeks uh, the shallowest you know kind of warmest you know kind of muddy water where they can live um, mm-hmm. 
and then they they basically hybridize the smallmouth out of existence so mm. and i know that's not necessarily a mortality thing but as far as diseases and all that i mean it's just there's nothing that's like oh my goodness this is killing them all you know the large mouth bass virus was a thing for a while and mm-hmm. it's kind of like coronavirus for, for us it's a new thing and once you built that natural immunity then you know you don't really see a, a big effect um there was those gill lice or gill maggots, the copepod mm-hmm. that attach to their gills. It can harm the weak ones. Mm-hmm. You, and then you just have all sorts of bacterial and fungal diseases. Usually you see that in the warmer water months. Um, mm-hmm. And it's typically from handling or just you know, this fish getting older, whatever reason, um, mm-hmm. just weak. But a good rule of thumb for that, just for people that are interested, if it's red, um, if it's red and kind of bloody, it's a bacterial infection. And if it's brown and fuzzy or kind of yellow and fuzzy, it's a, it's a fungal. And usually what happens is you get like a, they get like a cut or some kind of abrasion, the bacterial infection sets in and then the fungal grows on top of it. But once it's kind of brown and fuzzy, it's fungus. And uh, if they can push through the warmer water, usually that heals in the winter, that kind of thing. But that would be the kind of the top three. It's not really a whole lot of diseases, but those, invasive alabama bass uh you know people call them coosa bass uh or alabama spot what um what else they call them but the coosa bass is actually a totally different animal but anyway Mm -hmm. they're they're definitely a a threat to our populations right now yeah and we've we've talked about that before and 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 they really are And, and what's fascinating is i've been seeing a change in probably the past like three four years where Places where I used to catch a lot of big smallmouth, now I'm catching a lot of big mean mouths. And mm-hmm. places where it used to be a lot of large mouth, it's nothing but spots. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it is in Parksville is I mean is a mm-hmm. shining example yeah. of yeah. exactly what you talk about, where yeah. the spots literally force the large mouth to the backs of the creeks, mm-hmm. and they get in the flattest, muddiest part of the mm-hmm. creek that they can find because that's where we go toss big glide baits if you want to catch a really big large mouth yeah. and it's because they're they've been forced there which yeah. is fascinating i mean like what was it was it people bringing them in and introducing them or was it i mean i'm guessing just people brought them in and introduced them is it was it just kind of ignorance to the understanding that hey it's not good to put this in here and mm-hmm. somebody put a coosa river spot in parksville and now we're here where we're at now mm-hmm yeah, I mean, there. It's like like. It's hard to say one hundred percent, but yes, it's that's the most likely scenario is that somebody brought them in. They're they're in the Little Tennessee River watershed, you know, in North Carolina and Georgia, and they're they're coming downstream. Matter of fact, we now have them in Calderwood and Teleco, um, mm-hmm. their gene anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, one of the things that's happens is, yeah, you you get those pretty decent size for a while, and then they start they start getting small because, you know, you have that kind of new, new reservoir effect with a new species. That's typically mm-hmm. how you get your largest fish. And then once they're established and they're in there and have plenty of year classes um, above and below them, then their growth rate slows down pretty considerably. So they they mm-hmm. don't get as big. Um, and then when they start hybridizing your, your mutts, you know, as I call them, your, your <laughs> cross, you know, between smallmouth and, and spot and Alabama spot and all that, they, they typically have a worse growth rate too. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's interesting. It, so they're in Calderwood. Well, that just kind of piques my interest just a little bit. Cause it makes me think, huh, I wonder if there's a six pound spot swimming around in Calderwood. <laughs> anyway, like I need to, I need to go up. I've always wanted to go to that rabbit hole. Here you go. I've looked at that like a thousand times on Google earth and I've never been there. I just need to go there and like, check it out. Cause I've heard it's a really cool place, but like, so, so pretty much like those spots get in there, you'll see this pop off where it's like, you know, you got four or five, six years of just giant spotted bass, like mm-hmm. Parksville's a great example. I mean, you know, yeah. guys catching six pound spotted bass down there, but then all of a sudden, once there's enough age classes in there, you get the Lake Lanier effect where, yeah, there's mm-hmm. big ones there, but mm-hmm. for the most part, they're all one, two, three pounds, yeah. and you have those outliers of the giants. Mm-hmm. So That's correct. Did... Par- well, I was oh, going to say Par- Parksville uh-huh. is is basically an anomaly of all this, the Alabama spotted bass invasion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's mm-hmm. the only reservoir that at least we know about, and I'm talking all the states. I was, uh, at that meeting I was telling about earlier, we had a group of folks that met about that, and, of course, it's 
you know, Georgia, North Carolina, and now even in Virginia and Tennessee uh, are all experiencing the same thing. And Parksville is the only one that has been uh, that you have big fish and, and, you know, and they've stayed pretty big, but everywhere mm -hmm. else, you know, even Lanier, they didn't do like they did in Parksville. Yeah. Yeah. Parksville is an interesting place. It is. It fascinates me as an angler because it's one of those places. And this is from an angler like point of view, you go down there and it's really hard to get those fish to eat a whole lot, mm. but you can tie on a 12 inch swim bait and they'll blast it. And it's like, and I'm talking, we're, I'm talking big six ounce jointed glide baits. You know what I mean? And I'm probably making a bunch of people mad talking about this right now, but <laughs> it is what it is. But it's like fascinating to see that, that it's like those fish are that conditioned to that type of forage, that there's something about a giant bait like that, that they want to try to kill it. And, you know, a lot of people say it's the trout. A lot of people say, you know, it is what this, that, whatever. You know, and I've never personally seen a trout in that lake, but I've also not spent a ton of time there. But is there, this is another rabbit hole we're about to go down, but is there like a conditioning to that? Do bass get conditioned to eating a certain size of bait? And that's just kind of what that is? Yeah, I mean, you know, just kind of just their behavior. I, a friend of mine, and I think I may have said this one time on this show, but a friend of mine who's also a biologist and, and a friend, and he, he was kind of describing it like if somebody stole you, I don't know, miniature marshmallows and you're catching them in your mouth, if they throw a Reese piece here, or M&M or something, you're going to kind of say, wait a minute, that's different. So, yeah, yeah I mean, they, I guess they do maybe get conditioned for that. And there are trout in there. We, Our agency stocks trout uh, in the cool water, cool months. And uh, so I, there's no doubt they, you know, they will target them, uh, yeah. I would imagine. So yeah. there may be something to that for sure. I mean, if you're experiencing that, then I would say there's definitely something to that if, if it's yeah. a regular thing for you. Yeah, yeah. It's a regular thing for a lot of people. It's like, it's kind of a known thing. Like if you're going to go down there, tie on something giant because there will be the potential to catch a 30 pound bag. And there'll also be the potential to catch those truly giant spots. Like those mm -hmm. ones that, you know, they look like something from Bullard's Bar in California. Mm -hmm. and, and there's yeah. so many people that are very, like, optimistic about Parksville yeah. to be that, like, trophy spotted bass lake like a Bullard's Bar. Because, I mean, it's like every year that those spots just keep getting bigger. And you keep hearing uh -huh. about, oh, there's another state record. Oh, there's another state record. You know what I mean? And it is it is a fascinating lake. I really enjoy it just because it is so fascinating. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now, that and being said – no, go ahead. I was just going to say it's its own worst enemy because people see that there and think, well, I want this in my lake or my body of water. And they take those fish and, and it, it doesn't work there. And, and it's likely not going to anywhere else, but there. So yeah, it, it's, it's not a good, you know, it's great for the anglers, but it's, it's, it's a nightmare for us to try to like, no way, this is not really how it's supposed to be. Cause we got <laughs> yeah a hundred other places where we've shown that it's not doing that. And this is just yeah. for whatever reason it's happened there. And, it's likely well, due to some of the forage that we stock. And then, you know, again, just being the new kind of new kid on the block where there's not a lot of competition, they, they've been, have been able to grow really good in there and do well. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it is really hard to convince somebody when you catch a five pound spot that they're not a good <laughs> idea. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Because yeah. there's nothing quite like that. <laughs> I mean, especially when they blow up on a top water or eat a glide bait, it's like every bass angler out there starts jonesing for that over and over and over again. Now, just to keep a little bit more down the rabbit hole and then we'll get back on the on the topic of of everything else that we were talking about but i guess it's still on topic um i know there's been a lot of those spots caught below parksville now and they're starting to show up in the hawassi and i'm starting to hear about a lot of guys catching giant spots in the hawassi is that an issue that is to be worried about or do you think it's one of those things where the Hawassi is big enough and Chickamauga is big enough and there's enough big large mouth and big striper that those spots are going to stay? Or you, is there a worry that that is just going to run rampant and eventually we're going to see a lot of spots in the Hawassi? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a worry because, you know, Chickamauga is, is Chickamauga. I mean, it's yeah. fantastic large mouth fishery. And if, if it goes downhill because of that fish, then, you know, it, it's, that's it's it's the outcome that we don't want. Now yeah. the million dollar question is, will it happen or, or how long and all that? And only time will tell. The good, I guess, the good, um, at least the piece of information that may 
the good news so far is that typically those Alabama spotted bass do not do well in shallow, uh, well, basically a reservoir like Chickamauga. They would do better gotcha. in steep-sided, rocky, more clear like a Norris or a, you know, or a South Holston or maybe even Teleco to some point. But Chickamauga yeah. is not usually their favorable habitat. Mm-hmm. But again, we you know we just don't know what's going to happen until they're they're to that threshold where they can start you know becoming an effect and and, uh, and do some damage to the large amount population. So would it be would it be proper to say that if you're starting to see mean mouse that there is a substantial population of spotted bass that you may just not be seeing that are obviously spawning with with smallmouth? And that's what happens is you you lose that pure genetics of both smallmouth and and spotted bass whether it's our native kentucky spot or the alabama spot and you just have those mutts like i was talking about earlier and they just cross you know hybridize with other fish and a lot of the times we we call it and you would call it a smallmouth and it's i've got the data from calderwood it's amazing there's 14 smallmouth we collected there and half of them were pure hybrids. They were 50% Alabama bass and 50% smallmouth, but we did not know oh. that they were hybrids, mean mouse. Wow. Some, it's kind of like dominant traits in people. You know, you, some kids look just like mm-hmm. their mama or some kids look just like their dad. And if they do, you don't, you know, you can't tell. And it's no different with fish. That's just, well, this one looks more like a smallmouth, but it actually carries the genes of the Alabama bass. Too. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's been fascinating is like, I've, I've caught, I've caught some that you look at it and you're like staring at it and you're like, it looks weird. Like it's not, a, it's way too small mouthy. And then I've caught other ones, you know, they got the big old mouths and just, they got that long tapered body and you can just, they got the bars on their face. Look like a tiger. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's very, it's very fascinating. Do, do they grow faster uh, or is, do they have pretty much the same growth rate as a small mouth or like, vice versa again or is it like what you said some yeah. genes are like the mom some genes are like the dad just roll the dice yeah i mean it, the growth rates are not just phenomenally different like an f1 largemouth you know we, we don't see that at least nobody's reporting that and uh, mm-hmm. but it, it, it's not a you know a true hybrid between a smallmouth bass and a alabama spotted bass may exhibit some of that hybrid vigor but no i mean we've not noticed it or or nobody's reporting it like they've studied it and said hey this is something this is a thing but you know it just takes a couple generations where you lose all that yeah so can a normal spotted bass spawn with a smallmouth too or is it just the coosa river spots no it's i mean the thing so our smallmouth here grew up with spotted bass our natives Mm -hmm. So they've got reproductive barriers and, uh, you know, there's something out there that keeps them from doing that. Now you're going to have any, especially like centrarchids are the, the, the family, centrarchidae. And so that includes like bluegill and all of the sunfish and they hybridize very easily because their, their niches are the same. They're, they're, you know, they like to breed in the uh, same areas. They spawn and build nests and it's no different in bass. So you're going to have some natural hybridization, but it's, you know, 5% or less. But when you add, Alabama bass into the mix. Well, they hybridize readily with our smallmouth and are also our native spots. So, mm. I mean, it's almost like, you know, a hundred percent of the time they're going to hybridize. I don't know what it is. It's not a hundred, obviously, but it's way more than 5%. Well, it's like it's enough that you catch them. And yes. that's kind of my thought process is if, if I am one angler on a boat able to go catch at least one mean mouth in a day, there's something to that because I mean, of the tens of thousands of fish that are probably swimming around me, there's mm-hmm. enough of those things that one decided to bite my stuff. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah. that's, uh, that's enough for me. I mean, that may be, it sounds very anecdotal, but like in the, in the percentages and like when you start looking at the numbers, like what's the actual chance that that bite yeah. bass is going to bite your Ned rig, yeah. like for the mean mouth out of the bunch to bite your Ned rig. That means that there's quite a few of them there. And so that's, yeah. that's fascinating. And now, and just so people understand this, there are two different species of spots because I've seen some comments about people um, talking about like spots in Gunnersville and spots in different places. So mm-hmm. there's there's spotted what? So I call like normal spotted bass Kentucky spotted bass, and then the Coosa River spotted bass. I call those Coosa River spotted bass. Mm-hmm. And then those are two completely different mm-hmm. um, species of bass. I mean, it's like comparing a tiger to a lion. It's yeah, they're both felines, but they're two completely different things. Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah. the Alabama spot or the Coosa River spot, whatever people call them, 
is it's my crop my cropterus henshawi and it's native to the mobile basin which the coosa river flows into it and we actually have a small stream the conasaga creek river in hamilton uh, hamilton and polk or maybe just polk county where they do occur so they're quote native to tennessee but it's only in that very small corner of the state that that flows into the mobile basin the rest of our state is either the tennessee river or the cumberland river watershed or direct tributary to the mississippi mm -hmm. and those fish are not in those river systems they are the the now the kentucky bass or the, the spotted bass um they are in the Cumberland and Tennessee river systems, but mm -hmm. you probably won't find them. And I don't know hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure you won't find them in the, the Mississippi tributaries. Um, gotcha. But they are native here. And again, that's like I was saying, they, you know, they grew up together. They're, they have reproductive bears, but when you introduce the, the mobile basin spots, the Alabama spots, uh, in other words, there's no reproductive barriers. So they readily hybridize and all those reservoirs across North Georgia and Western Carolina on into Charlotte and up into Virginia. Now they're in Curve Scott, which is the new new river. And I'm just hoping that they do not affect the wonderful smallmouth fishery in the new river. I mean, even though it's not a Tennessee thing, but you know, I yeah. think some of your listeners, people that watch you have yeah. fish there. Yeah. So that what I was going to say about that is all those reservoirs I mentioned, they they can't find pure smallmouth so they've actually come and gotten a few from us to, to raise at the national fish hatchery in warm springs georgia to be able to stock some of those reservoirs just so they'll have smallmouth in there because it's all yeah. hybrids there's not even pure spotted bass left it's everything in there's a female that's crazy that's that's nuts i didn't even know that well and you know i have been seeing that over the past few years you know there's some guides over in western north carolina um that have for years caught giant smallmouth in lakes mm -hmm. and now they're not anymore they're and gone they're gone and it's just spots and i mean now they're catching giant spots you know and i mean obviously the the clientele is still there the fish is still there to catch but it's but they've just eradicated a whole population of natural smallmouth which is a shame i mean because there's nothing quite like a smallmouth you know what I mean? Like it's I don't I don't ever want to see a day when I I have to go drive eight hours north to catch a smallmouth because our Tennessee smallmouth are very different than northern smallmouth and they're a heck of a lot of fun to catch. You know what I mean? There's nothing quite like a Tennessee River smallmouth because a Tennessee River smallmouth will eat a six inch swim bait on a three quarter ounce head. Those smallmouth up north, you got to drag a net rig, and that's just no fun. I want to catch them on a big swim bait. So, um, if somebody asked over in the comments. Asian carp update are, are we still is it still death destruction and mayhem are they still playing Metallica at Kentucky Dam like what, what's happening there <laughs> yeah um, it, it's a uh, so our, we have seen our electrofishing sampling that the population has recovered somewhat there was a downward trend especially in large mouth and crappie and those guys out there in region one have, have seemed to think that, uh, you know, it's, it's doing okay. It's not the best, but it's, you know, it's not continuing on that downward trend mm -hmm. and the fish fence, the BAFF bioacoustic fish fence, where it uses light sound and bubble curtain to keep those fish out is working pretty good. They've got tagged fish, uh, that they know and they've got transmitters out in the river and they've tagged, I don't know how many hundred so far individuals that they know, Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they, you know, looked at their, where they swam back and forth and, um, they do not cross those barriers readily. Now they can, but it's very limited. Yeah. So the plan is to put a, you know, that barrier like below Kentucky and Barkley. Mm -hmm. And then also at the Northern end of that, I guess is Pickwick or not Northern, the Southern, the upstream end. <laughs> Yeah. is a uh, pickwick that's a weird one right there when it comes yeah right up. yeah it don't make well, any sense yeah no the rivers are not supposed to do that but uh yeah. but then they utilize commercial angling to help reduce their numbers and so you know it's a pretty good plan and and so far we think it's going to work and the over the 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 best news out there is that we have still yet to detect any any natural reproduction in tennessee good so that means that any fish that's in there has had to move into that body of water. And if we can put those barriers there that limits that greatly, then yeah, you're never going to completely get rid of them. Um, 
I mean, maybe that's a possibility, but it's likely not. But at least you can reduce the numbers and make it more controllable where the sport fish won't be affected. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone still needs to contact Metallica and tell them that their song was used at one point or another to to get rid of Asian carp. I just still think that's awesome. Yeah. I've seen Metallica in concert. I can understand why a fish would swim the other direction. So there you go. All right. So <laughs> to to reback a line because there we go. There's rabbit hole number three for tonight. To reback a line, kind of where we were talking talking about viruses and stuff like that. So viruses, for the most part, and like largemouth bass disease, really isn't something that we have to worry about uh, an exceptional amount. Like it's definitely right. something to kind of keep our eye on, but like, we're not death destruction to mayhem right. with that one. Right. At and, least here. Yeah. yeah. At least here. Yeah. Yeah. And it, what I was talking about earlier is we, there was actually a lake up North near Ben, uh, Northern Michigan, little lake. I mean, tiny, you know, I mean, this lake is probably like 14, 1500 acres. I mean, you know, and there's a lot of those up there in Michigan and they're glacial lakes. And so you'll have these lakes that are just as, essentially a giant sand bowl. And out in the middle, it's 75 foot deep and around the edges, mm -hmm. you know, you have these 10 foot deep sand flats and they're clear mm -hmm. as a bell and there's giant smallmouth in them because it's just a bunch of smallmouth and a bunch of perch and a bunch of, you know, everything else they like to eat. And so you yeah. end up having these smallmouth that are that long, that wide, and it's a ton of fun to go catch them because they never see baits. Well, there was one of those lakes that ended up, um, and, and, and I don't know how this happens, and this is probably a really great question for you. There was a large, there was, so this is a this is a weird story, but and, and it's a long, long way around it, but we'll get there. Ben actually ended up catching a ginormous largemouth out of this lake. And it was like a really, I mean, like a six, six, almost seven pound largemouth. So a giant for Michigan, a giant for Northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. And in a lake where um, Ben said that those backs are, he said that lake and another lake is actually back to being healthy, but this is still going to be an interesting topic. I think we'll want to talk about catches this big largemouth. And so very unusual, like it doesn't make any sense of that largemouth there. The only way Ben kind of, deduce that the largemouth was there was somebody put the largemouth into the lake because it just does like when i say you catch a lot of smallmouth john i mean like you only catch smallmouth and there are uh, there's just millions of them in this lake you know what i mean or hundreds of thousands of them and so then not too long after that a couple of years i go back up there and um like the smallmouth are very unhealthy like we went from catching four and five pound smallmouth to catching smallmouth that have sores on them, you know, big, like half dollar size sores, you know, spots all over them. You know, they're skinny, they're dying. I mean, like you can tell these fish are very unhealthy. And the only thing that I think the DNR ended up determining or what they said, Ben just said it was that, that frogs brought in the largemouth bass virus and that the smallmouth got it. So, I'm guessing smallmouth can get largemouth bass virus or did they get something, another version of it? Or was it a, a, a new strain or, you know, like, you know, that's our big, that's our hot button word nowadays. But like, like what, what do you think that that was or kind of, I don't know what's your opinion. I mean, obviously we have, it's very anecdotal. There's not many facts yeah. here. There's not a lot of data, but in your opinion, can, can smallmouth bass get largemouth bass virus? And is that something you have to worry about in small bodies of water like that? I, I don't know. I, I really don't know the answer to that. Hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting. I mean, obviously, two people's experience, right? Me and Ben, yeah. and we experienced this. And Ben said the lakes, I'm glad, are getting back to normal. But it was really weird. I mean, like, first couple yeah. years, I mean, like, it's the lake you go to. It's the lake where you catch giants. I mean, it is like we would drive two and a half hours out of our way to go to this lake yeah. to you can't catch a fish over two or three pounds, and they all look yeah. like zombies. You know what I mean? Very yeah. weird. It is bizarre. I mean, I would imagine that smallmouth could catch it, but I, I really don't know. I've never, it, just because, you know, by, when, by the time I was doing this job, that largemouth bass virus thing was, you know, sort of lived its life and it wasn't a huge concern. So I've never really looked into that, but there's a lot of things that can cause a population to crash. And it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's something about water quality too, that could mm -hmm. be something affecting them in there or, um, and there's just no telling, but also the, you know, as far as the size of fish, that goes through kind of a cyclic pattern. And I think we've talked mm -hmm. about that too, where, yeah. you know, you just kind of lose those big fish and then it takes a while for them to, to go through that again. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I can't answer that, but I really don't know. 
Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it was just one of those weird things, you know. It's one of those weird things. Like I experienced it, and it's like I've told a bunch of people about it, and we're like, "What do you think?" How? You know, it's like everybody kicks around a bunch of ideas of like what actually went on. So, do and this is kind of an offshoot of that question. Do you guys see like weird viruses pop up like in a small population of fish, and it like runs through them, and then it just disappears, and we're not really sure what it is? Is that happen, or is that just not something that happens? No, I mean, there, there's going to be things like that, but you know, we, we, we look at fish, uh, and, and maybe if there's some kind of weird thing, we'll take a sample. Uh, but you see that more done at like hatcheries where, you know, you can literally lose a whole pond because of disease, but in, in the wild, it's, it's very rare that it spreads rampant like that. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, I, I just, I can't think of anywhere been my experience where disease done something to a, population where it was like oh my goodness except at a hatchery yeah because they're the fish are so packed in there and they're so confined and there's all they're always touching and rubbing and mm -hmm. you know there's 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 always too many fish for the water and we have to do things to manipulate that to you know like add oxygen and and you know all these aerators and things to make sure that you don't get your your uh, nitrogen cycle out of whack but mm -hmm. in in the wild in a, in a stream or reservoir especially you i I'm, it's not really a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, in, that's interesting because I, I guess when you think about it, you know, like one of the big things that we're talking about now um, in deer is CWD, mm -hmm. you know, deer inherently are going to touch each other and like, mm -hmm. you know, be in close contact with each other and they're going to eat off things that other deer have ate off of. Whereas a bass or any fish for that matter, for the most part outside of like a shad or schooled mm -hmm. up bass, like they just don't really touch each other. Like they're, it's not like they're, you know, if a bass poops, it's going to take a lot of like a lot of things to happen the right way for another bass to, yeah. in, you know, inhale that or get that into its body. Whereas like with a deer, it's just inherently going to happen because they're all there together and they move around. Yeah. Is there anything in this is probably going to be I can already probably say it's going to be a no, but is there anything like CWD in fish in general that you guys are like kind of like wary or watching or is there any of those things so i know one big concern here i guess this is the question i really want to ask and not to be doom and gloom and scare the crap out of anybody but like are there any of those like things like a prion disease in deer that people are scared could go to humans that exist in fish that could go to humans is that things that you guys worry about or is it just a, a non-concern no, I mean, it, anything that fish get that, you know, especially when you know, like we're eating them. I mean, if you cook it, it's going to be fine. It's usually bacterial. It might give you food yeah. poisoning or something, but yeah. no, there's nothing that I'm aware of yeah. at all. Like that. But now that doesn't mean it's not out there, but I mean, those, there's kind of like a specialized, uh, you know, fish, I don't know what you'd call them, but look at the necropsies and kind of things that cause death and mortality and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, I guess a, a toxicologist may be the better word, but you know, I'm usually not in that kind of world to rub elbows with those people. And I'm not hurting anything like that. Yeah. I bet that would be a very, like when you ask somebody, what's your job title? Well, I am a fish. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fish dissector. Yeah. I, I do. I do toxicology and fish. Oh, that's really weird. Yes, it is. <laughs> that's pretty funny. All right. So now we're going to really wade into the, uh, to the thick one here because we're going to okay. start talking about us and what we do to fish. And kind of start talking about like how humans interfere with fish because I think this is where we get into the into the the mud with a lot of different yeah. things. There's a lot of different people have a lot of different opinions about what actually yeah. kills fish. Yeah. So my thought process has always been, you know, I've had people tell me dropping fish from too high kills them if you drop them into the water. I've had people tell me, you know, boat flipping them can kill them. I've had people tell me all these different things. And kind of my thought process is, and this may be ignorant of me to think this, but driving a piece of steel into their head and jerking them into a world where they can't breathe and they can't see and holding them up for a picture and then putting them back in the water, mm -hmm. the the dropping them back in the water or the boat flip probably is one of the most minor kind of steps of the whole process of catching the fish, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like what in the process of a normal angler catching a fish is there any detrimental steps that they take that really does lead to a higher mortality where that fish, whether it dies on the bank or you put it back and it swims and dies, is there like a step in the process that an angler can take to alleviate that outside of just not keeping them outside of the water long enough, that kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. But like, like where, where, where do we go? I guess the question is, where do we go wrong? Where do we kill right. fish by catching them? Uh, catching them in hot water is, is the answer water. to that. So okay. there's been like, Texas does a lot of that research. Um, I mean, I've actually, we've done some on Sal Holston. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, our sample size was probably too small to determine any kind of pinpoint one little thing like you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But any, any time they do that, it's, it's, um, and again, this is just me remembering the things I've saw. And there may be some kind of new research that, that says the opposite, but there's nothing that's ever been pinpointed and say, Oh, well, right. Here's the step you need to fix. Mm. Um, I mean, this has been studied to death for right reasons because you're concerned and, and, and rightfully so. And so has other anglers since the catch and release became a thing and, you know, oxygenated aerators um, or live wells, uh, you know, you add the chemicals, you put ice in there, all that stuff is important and it mm-hmm. does play a factor, but, you know, slinging up against the boat or whatever, you know, tossing it from a high point, um, you know, all that can obviously harm them. But all the research points back to um, if you, uh, um, you know, keep, keep that fish, uh, especially like in a tournament situation, release it back in the hot water, especially larger fish, they're, they're, they're going to die. I mean, there's just hardly any way around that. Now, wow. now this basic catch and release, Mm-hmm. where you catch it, take a picture, put it back in. There is some mortality associated with that, but it's mm-hmm. pretty low. The article yeah. study we did on South Olson was about 10%. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even though that's low, but, you know, if you got thousands of people fishing, you know, you're talking about a pretty significant number of fish. But as managers, we look at mortality in two ways, and you've kind of touched on it. you got natural mortality, which can be a host of things, and you have angling mortality, which can also be a host of things. Mm-hmm. But to manage that fishery, you don't typically get concerned on any one point of that. You just want to know what part is natural and what point is the part is, is angling mortality. Mm -hmm. So if you can control that angling mortality with regulations and that's where we come into play and that's why I have a job. Yeah. Yeah. The natural mortality is really like, well, it, yes, obviously it plays an effect, but there's some populations like brook trap for exist, for example, um, they have 80% natural mortality every year. And wow. So really cool. a regulation is not going to have a big effect, but let's say the opposite of that. And I know we're talking about bass here, but just for example, yeah. be like sturgeon. Yeah. They live a hundred years. They reproduce, they don't reproduce till they're 20 and they don't reproduce every year. So you're going to have very low mortality. Whereas if you had a, 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 a recreational fishery where you kept them, you could have a huge effect because their mortality is so low, but brook trout mm-hmm. be the opposite. So bass kind of falls somewhere in the middle. Mm-hmm. And most of the angling mortality is from catch and release. You have very, very little harvest. And I'm on a huge rabbit hole here. I don't remember what question I'm answering, but <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> you're, uh, you're answering it all. Like I'm, okay. I'm just consuming. Keep going. Okay. And yeah. uh, so that's where you know the the it, the specific part of the angling mortality. You know, a lot, a lot of research done on. I mean, there's research done, but the, the it's more of how much. Okay, once you catch that fish. And put it back in the water at what point or how many of those die you know yeah. and that's yeah, where yeah. we come in and look at that and it's pretty significant for tournaments in warm water for big wow. fish like smallmouth yeah so the so pretty much the 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 guy who takes a picture of it mm-hmm. hey whatever puts him back in the water for the most part that fish is going to have a much higher chance of living <laughs> than the guy who puts it in the live well, especially in warm water, that most of those fish at those tournaments, even if they swim off, yes. are going to go die. Yes. What is killing them? Just just plain stress? Yeah. yeah. They they look at the, I think it's cortisol, the hormone level in the blood, yeah. and they can measure that. And, you know, you look at it, a fish that's been handled like that versus a fish that's just cut, catch and release, and that, that stress or hormone is a lot higher in that fish that's been handled. And even... If it's handled property, you know, it's always wet. It's got cool water. It's, it's fully oxygenated. There's chemicals in there to help reduce the stress. It, it just, for whatever reason, when they get released back in hot water, they just do not like it. And the yeah. older, the bigger the fish, the worse they take it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, to put it in human terms, and obviously a bass is experiencing its, its existence are completely different than we do. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it would be like putting us on a treadmill in 90-degree weather and then going, okay, 
now you got to go get in a steam room to try to de-stress yourself. Like it's just like your body's not gonna, I mean, your heart rate and everything. I mean, cortisol levels make your heart rate go up. They make your brain chemicals get disbalanced. I mean, in a human now, you know, a bass being a much smaller, much more really, if you think about it, feeble creature than we are, you know, we're a heck of a lot more resilient than a, than a bass is. Mm -hmm. I can see where it's just, I mean, it's going to, it's going to kill it, you know, and that, and that's, that's very interesting. So is there a temperature, at which bass do so i fished the tournament a couple weeks ago we put some obviously had to put the fish in the live well you know i carried them around we're in 53 degree water all my fish swim off healthy Mm -hmm. is there a water degree temperature where you see less mortality and Mm -hmm. is there you know i i after I let those fish go, I don't like putting fish in the live well. Just don't. Yeah. I, I told my buddy Michael the entire time I was doing it, I was like, I don't like doing this, but it just is what it is. You know what I mean? And so, like, I want to think all five of my fish swim off and they were very healthy. You know what I mean? And they're out there living their little bass lives and they're about ready to make some babies. But, like, what what's the water temperature where you guys see less fish deaths and the water temperature where you see more fish deaths? Yeah, yeah. But- it's about 80 degrees small mouth a little bit cooler about 75 um mm-hmm. you know if you have 80 degree water which is i mean it happens here pretty regularly um mm-hmm. you know later on in the summer you know it's it's an, it's going to affect them yeah yeah which is interesting so am i right in saying so one thing i say a lot and i catch myself saying this i love to fish river current i love to fish rivers fish in rivers are inherently just healthier looking than yeah. fish that live main lake mm-hmm. is that due to fish that live in rivers aren't as stressed by temperature as much as fish that live down lake where they have a more you know i mean you go up in the holston in july that water's mm-hmm. gonna be 70 maybe i mean there's days i've even seen it like 68 mm-hmm. you know what i mean you've got some of those fish that aren't spawning until july yeah. whereas you go down main lake at concord you'll have 85 degree surface temperatures okay. Yeah. Are those fish healthier, literally healthier, because they do live in that cooler water their entire life? Well, you know, fish are cold blooded, so their tolerance, their temperature tolerance, is is got a pretty wide range. Especially, you know, fish are adapted to our the, the temperate zone here in Tennessee, where you have winter, cold winters, and hot summers. And the my theory on that, Alex, would be it's probably related more to oxygen. Because mm-hmm. you've always got plenty of oxygen flowing water, whereas a reservoir you get pretty danger low occasionally, and mm-hmm. fish and the surface the surface is going to have the highest oxygen, mm-hmm. and especially bass they're they're not oriented to be a foot deep you know they're going to be mm-hmm. under the bait you know they kind of mm-hmm. come out and get you type behavior so they're they're going to limit themselves to kind of right where that cool water is mm-hmm. area the thermocline and usually that's where the lowest oxygen is so mm-hmm. they're they're just have to put up with that lower oxygen condition, you know, and it just makes it more unhealthy, just like it would for us. You know, if you had mm-hmm. problems with hemoglobin or whatever, you know, those mm-hmm. typical those people, you know, have problems with the immune systems and all that stuff. So that would be my theory, although I'm not a hundred percent sure about that, but that would be my theory. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's essentially, again, to put it in human terms, it's like taking me who's not used to it and putting me at base camp one on Mount Everest. I'm going to yeah. struggle. I'm going to struggle because I'm not used to that. And it, and I, and I guess could there be almost like a like a reciprocal effect in bass there where you take this bass who's really used to being up in a river and you drag it all the way down main lake and you put it in that water, it's probably going to kill it because it's just the stress of it's not good whereas if you take a bass main lake and take it up into a river, it might have a better chance of living because he gets introduced to this oxygen rich environment where it's never experienced something like that before i mean kind of a theory you know what mm-hmm. i mean it's it, it'd be yeah. very interesting it's like that that's a study tell them tell them alex Rudd, tell them alex rudd's got him one for him i think okay. i think we need to do that one okay. but no that's that is very fascinating but it's it is funny man you know i i, I love fishing current i love fishing anywhere water's flowing in and it just seems like anytime i'm in those situations like especially with creeks flowing in the fish are just I could say healthy. I mean, I mean, they are greener, they're darker, they're just more, they're more mm-hmm. pissed off. Like it's like everything <laughs> about them is just uh, hopped up a little bit. Yeah. And I guess yeah. it's just oxygen. I mean, they're getting everything that they need. They're getting good oxygen. It's that cooler than average water where they seem to thrive a little bit better. 
and you got as much bait as you need. They get up on a stick and they just sit there and they eat whatever comes by their face. And so that's very interesting. Yeah, see, it makes me feel good. I'm I'm the river guy. I'm I'm doing my part. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So so we've kind of talked about. I mean, obviously, putting fish in a live well, especially when it's warm, is hard on them. Cortisol, higher cortisol levels, which is your stress or hormone and a batch of stress or hormone, just the process of catching them already stresses them and then putting them in a box and driving them around stresses them. I mean, banging around in a boat's going to stress them. And so outside of that factor, if you're just looking at like a normal angler, right? You know, some guy who, um, let's say he catches a bass out of 25 foot and it's swim biter you know, blows up and we got mm-hmm. that situation, but he's mm-hmm. wanting to immediately put that fish back in the water. Yeah. What is the process that the guy needs to go to? Does he need to try to fizz that fish? Does he need to mm-hmm. educate himself on fizzing that fish or does he just need to put that fish back in the water? No, we actually, that was part of that study we did on Sal Holson. And um, it was more of like, it was controlled fizzing. Like we purposely fizz some purposely didn't. Mm-hmm. And again, Texas has done most of that research. We just did it to kind of, it was back when that, you know, what they call it, the, the Mickey rigs and all mm-hmm. that stuff, you know, basically you're just jigging a, a lure down right in the front of their face when they're schooled yeah. up or suspended deep. And, yeah. and, you, and it's called borrow trauma when you get that, uh, you know, stomach or air bladder coming out of their, their mouth. And uh, yeah. so we looked at some of that, but uh, yeah, it, we determined that fizzing, especially if you see that fish with yeah. its, you know, those signs that fizzing, at least it gives it a chance to get down there and heal uh, because it will not typically ever go down on its own. Yeah. Um, it, it just takes too long for that nitrogen to equalize again at that pressure, the atmospheric pressure at the surface of the water versus, you know, down deep. So yeah. uh, it's better to go ahead and fizz it. And the best way to do it is, Actually, you count about, and I, I forget exactly, but it's three or four scales back below the, the pectoral fin, and yeah. then this, and then stick that needle in, kind of straight, and then turn it, and then go in about an inch or two, and you'll you'll feel that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the good way to do is stick it underwater where you see the bubbles come out, and yeah. count to about three. Yeah. And then you know let it go, and if it doesn't, you may have to fizz it again, but. Yeah. But yeah, in our experience and everything I've seen, it's best to try to fizz it, even though you may kill it, but it, it's going to die anyway if it can't get swim back down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's something like, you know, it's one thing that, um, it's one thing that like, I kind of, it kind of drew me away from deep fishing because I used to love it. And, yeah. But it was like, man, we were killing fish. I mean, it's just straight up. Yeah. I mean, you would, you would have these fish and before you could get them back and unhooked and get them back in the water, they're already mm-hmm. belly up. And we're trying to fizz them and they're just dying on us. And I mean, it's, yeah. you know, I don't care. And this may be a little, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the type of person who, yes, it's an animal. Yes, there's some of them that have to die. But it really does suck when you kill a six pounder. I mean, it just yeah. does. You know, I mean, like oh, yeah. I have I have I have physically been upset because I've killed a four pound smallmouth before. And yeah. it was just one of those things that it was a freak thing. You know, what I mean, like yeah. it was one of those deals like the middle of November. The water's cold. I catch a fish on a crankbait. And that fish just dies. And, I, and I've, I've had that happen to me several times where I don't know if it's just the cortisol levels or what it is. It's like I've had them hit the deck of the boat and something just happens to them. Eyes lock and they're gone. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just like yes. freak. It's a freak thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's only ever happened maybe twice in my whole entire life. But man, you know, it's a, anytime that happens, you're just like you're almost physically ill. Like you want that mm-hmm. fish to go back. You want that fish to go make babies because, you know, that's the one that, that makes yeah. the good babies. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I had a very interesting conversation. This kind of stays on the track of, you know, humans killing fish in in our part. But like when you look at a giant bass, you look at this 10, 11, 12 pound bass. At what point in her life does she become unvaluable to the population? Like, is there a point in in your, in your studies, do bass die before they become a bass that can't have babies anymore or are they, do you guys see bass living past an age where they're not having babies anymore? You know, like a big buck, you know, a big buck gets to a point where he's just going to start killing other deer and and running off other deer, but he ain't going to be able to make any more deer. Does that happen in bass? I mean, I'm sure it does to some some extent, but I mean, typically if, if a fish is that weak that they can't produce enough energy to have eggs, then they're going to die anyway. 
Hmm. So, I mean, it, wow. it's just a natural thing for them to have those eggs. And, and yeah, they slow down, you know, just, mm-hmm. just like anything, any animal would at, at, at age. But uh, I would imagine that if you if you're a fish out there and you can't produce eggs and you're you're weak enough to not live. Wow, that's fascinating. That's I mean, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Like that they just and it's kind of the natural process of things, all right? It's a natural yeah, I think I think certain like your big um your bigger your bigger animals like your your uh you know, what is a I've heard them coin something. Steve Rinella coins them uh um charismatic super fauna or something mega, like that. Mega fauna. Yeah, charismatic mega fauna. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, you know, and obviously a deer is not mega fauna, but it is charismatic. I mean, like people love deer. I guess a deer just in the process of life is much different in the bass that the fact that their process of creating energy and, you know, dividing sales can far surpass their ability to reproduce. Whereas a bass is kind of more a simpler animal and that its process of producing sales and Mm -hmm. and replicating just when that stops, it all stops. It's just kind of a natural shutdown. You know what I mean? Yeah. Interesting. So let's talk about fish bleeding because that's a big one that a lot of people I've experienced it. Everybody's experienced it. Yeah. You know, you nick a gill, um, you get one hooked bad. Um, I've heard a thousand theories on how we take care of it. You know, I've heard Mountain Dew down the gills helps to get, stop the, you know, clots them right up. That's a thing I've heard. I've heard, you know, get them unhooked and get them in the water as fast as you can and they should be okay. Um, but like if, if we hook a fish bad, it's bleeding. What's the best thing an angler can do to try to help that fish to live? Or is that fish just knocking on the door to death? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's likely going to die. Um, I would say if you, if you've torn a gill raker out, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's bleeding. Now I have seen fish with that's had it already out. You know, it's obviously been, it's survived that, but Mm -hmm. you know, if, if it's harvestable and you like to eat them, I would say, you know, keep it because the chances of it dying are, are, pretty good but the best thing to do is just put it right back in the water as quick as you can right. i mean there may be some sort of topical medicine they make you know that that I, but I, I don't know <laughs> yeah or mountain dew yeah. i don't know it may work great yeah. i don't know yeah. that would be an interesting there's another interesting study alex tell them alex has got another one for him there we're gonna be <laughs> we're gonna be taking bass back and forth and we're gonna be pouring mountain dew down their throat but yeah that's one like mountain dew and coke like any like yeah. really sugary drink mm-hmm. and it's got to be like the regular one um, I but you. if you I, and I've seen it happen, like I'll have one bleeding, you hit their gills with, and it just clots the blood immediately, and I put them in the water and they swim away. Mm-hmm. And I mean, obviously that fish may swim off and die, and yeah. I never know that it happens. But yeah. very interesting. Now hooking them in the tongue or deep hooking them, yeah. Um, getting the hook out of there obviously is the the biggest thing you want to do. You know what I mean? And there's a bunch of different tricks for that. I've shown how to do it on my channel before. There's a bunch of videos mm-hmm. out there but is it worth it like when you hook them deep like that when you tongue hook them or get them down there in the in the crusher part and you know deeper than that is that fish dead or is that fish got a chance yeah it's hard to say i mean they can extract those hooks it goes through their digestive system and i mean we've we've sampled them you know over the years with hooks in different portions of their body and i mean you know the the old wives tail or, or at least maybe not a wives tail but just the theory is that you know you just cut the let, leave the hook in there because it might do more damage but i mean it, it's really hard to say they've got some good tools and i'm sure on your like you described it, the way to extract them now even out of the gut down there way in the in the stomach but uh i would say if you can get it out without tearing ripping a bunch of holes and you probably do okay but if not i would just take a chance on leaving it in there because it just rusts out naturally and probably well, last the, time. I don't think it rusts necessarily. I mean, it's a big piece of metal usually, but it, they can extract it through their digest. They have an amazing way to do it. Like even when we implant tags inside their body, they can just, it's like their skin grows around it and it just pushes it out, out of its body. And the same wow. kind of thing happens with those hooks. It just kind of, it, they can extract things out of foreign objects out of their body. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. And I've seen that. I mean, I've seen them, poop out hooks i've seen them poop out line i've seen them poop out sinkos i mean like it's amazing what their body can process yeah. and that's always something i've been kind of fascinated about i mean you know i've hooked some fish pretty bad before and it's whatever you don't feel the bite or they just decide mm-hmm. that it's they're gonna like yeet it as hard as they possibly can and i mean they, they just get it yeah. um but like you know 
it's one of those deals you just slip that hook out and like i don't know I, that was just always one that i was very interested in because it is one of those deals you know just clip it do you take it out do you leave it but i guess the biggest thing is just cause as least amount of trauma as possible to the bass because again from what i'm gathering and you can tell me whether i'm right or not it's stress that kills fish i mean stressing yeah. out a fish outside of physically harming them like mm -hmm. you know cutting something or jabbing mm -hmm. something in them it's just stress that kills most of the fish that we interact with that seems to be the correct statement and you know there may be specific things like where the but even those stuff i mean they look at like hook placement where it was hooked how bad it was hooked and yeah. just all those things you can measure you know and it, it just there's really nothing that's been come back and said oh this is it or this is the one it's just they just die because whatever reason it's typically delayed mortality and you know mm -hmm. up to three days later and especially in warmer water yeah wow up to three days later so yeah. tell me a little bit about that like so so you guys are it's not immediate like these fish aren't swimming off and they're dead in 10 minutes you can see it up to three days later that yes. these fish are, are dying yes yeah i mean that's kind of the rule of thumb and you know we've tracked them for two weeks and um on south holson and i think a lot of the places a lot of the research it's two to three weeks is what you typically see and and uh, when you pass a certain point it's hard to say well it's from this activity yeah so you know i think kind of like i say the rule of thumb is three days but i mean most of them will swim off but that doesn't mean they're going to be okay you know you most of that mortality especially like i say from the the tournament activity and in, in the warm water i mean you know a lot of those fish swim off which is great but mm -hmm. but a lot of them die uh, mm -hmm. you know two to three days later usually it's within a day but sometimes it's up to three like you know 80 degree water you get an 18 inch smallmouth you're going to mm -hmm. catch it midday whatever you know mid part of your tournament haul, haul mm -hmm. it for two or three hours wait in release it it's going to swim off but it's yeah. also going to die you i mean it's yeah. like 95 percent or greater that a large smallmouth bass in the hot water is going to die when it swims away I love it. I love that statement. I love the, yeah. I love the, I love the, like, that is what is going to happen. And I think yeah. that's like what people need to hear is because like, there's a, there's a ton of arguments. There's a ton of disagreements, but I mean, when you really look at the data, when you really look at the science behind what it is, like these fish are dying, yes. whether it swims away or not as good as you want to feel about that. And that's when you get into the whole morality of the situation. Mm -hmm. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole tonight. That's a good one. That's a that's a Steve yeah. Rinella topic. Maybe we can try to convince them to come on and talk about that. But like that fish is going to die. Like yeah. if it's in eighty degree water, like there is a ninety five ish percent chance, mm -hmm. which is pretty dang on good. You don't want a ninety five percent chance of getting shot in in the middle of a shootout. <laughs> that that fish is is going to die. So that. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So what an angler can really take away from this is in warmer climates, it is the best to fish, catch, photo, release as soon as you can get mm -hmm. that fish back into the water and and to just really be cognizant and mindful of how you treat the fish in that warmer water because of the amount of stress. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the cooler water, we still want to have that amount of respect for the fish and the amount of mm -hmm. respect for what we're doing with it. But we've got a little bit more of a, a leeway just because there isn't as much stress in the cooler water environment. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's way less. That's why the, you see our regulations kind of uh, encourage though, especially for small mouth. A large mouth can handle warmer water a lot better than small mouth, but yeah. you know, like on Norse and Cherokee and Douglas, you have that, you know, smaller size limit in the winter time than you do in the summer. So someone asked this question and, and I think it's a, a fantastic question because I think it only is going to validate what we're talking about. This stuff that we're talking about, this is backed up by science and tagging and shock studies and things that you guys are doing. So this is like the actual science part of your job where you get to go out and be a scientist. That's where these numbers, these stats, these things that we're talking about are actually coming from. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, I mean, I, I would say I'm generalizing some, but it's from research that I've read and, and, and over the years, and it's three or four papers that have very similar numbers and, and you kind of talk to your peers and that's the, okay, here's what we know. You know, it's like I said, 80 degree water, 18 inch smallmouth. If you hold it in a tournament situation, it's going to die. when You release mm -hmm. it in warm water. Wow. I mean, I can say that confidently based on science, not just my own, 
observation or two or three fish. I mean, it's study upon study, and you can look it up in Texas, and they do more on large amounts because that's what they have. But Tennessee Tech has done smallmouth studies and all that stuff, and it always comes kind of back to that those two those numbers, you know, eighty yeah. degrees and eighteen inches. And I mean, sometimes you have water warmer than that. Yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah, and I, and see. Not everybody's a weirdo like I am. I'm the guy who actually goes on Google and goes to like the the college like paper part of Google and like types in studies about bass and reads studies. Like I'm that guy. Like, and I've had people tell me, no, you're not. And I'm like, do you want to see my search history? Like, yes, I am. I've read things that I don't understand everything that's in the paper, but damn it, I got a dictionary and I'll figure it out. (laughs) I'm that guy because it is, it does fascinate me. I think the science behind understanding why bass does what it does how it does what it does, where it does what it does is going to make you a better angler at the end of the day. And so, mm-hmm. okay, another question. This is another human impact question. And the human, I, I probably should have prefaced this whole thing by saying the human part's probably going to be the biggest one because, I mean, with our interjection into nature in any shape, form, or fashion, there's a benefit in some way and then there's a detriment in other ways. You know, I mean, yeah. it's good that we control predators because they yeah. don't, we don't want them killing everything, but also, you know, the natural way. Anyway, that's, we're here now. You know what I mean? Like we're on earth. We interact that's with right. these things. That's we right. have, we have intellect, we have intelligence. So we yeah. have to figure out how to interact with these things in a way that's going to help to keep them around for a long time. That yeah. statement's out there, but the TVA, God love them. I've reached out several times. I cannot get anybody to come on this podcast. Cause I want to ask them about this, but jerking lake levels up and down. And you know, this, I mean, you know, you've seen how these lakes, they can go up, they can go down, they can go super low, they can go super high, they can um, get flushed out, they can get turned over. There's so many different things that the TVA specifically does, and I'm sure other um, organizations throughout the country that control dams and things do too, but the TVA especially, and especially Highland Reservoirs, which is more your expertise. Mm -hmm. Do you guys see those lake-level fluctuations affecting the bass in a negative way and especially when it comes to this time of year during spawning, do you see a mm-hmm. negative impact with lake levels doing this? Yeah, very rarely because bass reproduction in the, in southeastern reservoirs, where you're talking, you know, the main stem Tennessee River or the headwater systems like, you know, even Watauga, Douglas, where they're fluctuated 30, 40, even north, 50 mm-hmm. feet. Reproduction is not an issue. Growing them big is typically the issue because they have to run that gauntlet through all these things we've talked about that might kill them to get big. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the the enough bass, enough baby bass is rarely a problem. Mm. It's just getting them big. Yes. Wow. And that makes sense. So that makes sense. So that's why a lake like Norris catching a seven pounder is doing something because there's not many seven pound class fish in a Norris lake because they've, it's just the TVA is just kind of an added extra detriment to the to the whole other bunch of crap that they got to get through to get that big. Well, I mean, actually, a drawdown is good yeah. for predators because it it, oh. it pulls the the prey. You know, the shad are more concentrated and you know whatever they're eating on. Mm-hmm. And the only thing it would harm is the reproductive cycle. And for bass, it's not an issue. It it doesn't take very many bass to have a successful nest to replenish that year class. They do pretty well. Now, because, you know, they're long-lived, there's not much harvest, that kind of thing. Now, crappie is a totally different story, although it typically doesn't affect their reproduction unless it happens in a critical point in that. Mm -hmm. And and it can, and it often does, Mm -hmm. but it's not a normal thing. Like, every year it doesn't just kill them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's pretty much one of those things, it's like, bass are going to do what bass are going to do. They're going to go have babies and ain't nothing we can really do to stop that process. And like, it doesn't take, I mean, let's say that out of, and I don't know if this is an exact number, but let's say there's, it's generalized. There's a million bass in, you know, Lost Creek in, on Norris. If 10,000 of them all go have, how many baby, how many bass eggs do they have normally when they lay it? I mean, it's, 30, 40,000 or so. It's not, yeah. So if 10,000 of them have 40 to 50,000 eggs, and let's say that just a, a you know, 5% of those eggs actually make it to maturity, we go have plenty of bass. Like that's yep. not the problem. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So the TVA's fluctuation 
I love this. Hold on, I got to get this one in here. Just because your name is John Hammonds, so close to John Hammond, he said nature finds a way. So yes, yes. it always does. <laughs> yes. Okay, there, there that is. We've got our Ian, Ian Malcolm quote out of the way too. Jurassic Park's done for tonight. Let's keep going. Um, where was I going with this? I'm, I've totally lost my train of thought now. Um, um, but so TVA fluctuating lakes. More is just affecting our individual anecdotal bites and mm. the bites that we're on and, and the way that we catch fish more than it actually is affecting the lake population or the fish yes. population or doing anything to, to the detriment of our fish population. Yes. yes, that's correct. Yeah. So that being said, and this kind of keeps going down that rabbit hole do so obviously the bite is affected. So does the lake fluctuation cause stress on the fish? Are we seeing, is there any correlation between stress on the fish and any mortality rates or anything happening like that with just lake levels going up and down and, and moving the fish around or are the fish just, it's part of life and they just move and it's just, we can't catch them cause they're not eating. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I would imagine there's, I mean, there's probably some, but, you know, again, a drawdown is good for predator fish because it, it makes the prey available. But I'm just trying to think of what, what that would look like. Is it, you know, well, like a, a turnover can sometimes be bad. But uh, because, it, you know, if it's sudden and it, you get all that unoxygenated water, all, all of a sudden yeah. comes to the top. Yeah. But that's not really a function of a drawdown or a, a TVA thing. That's just, you know that's a natural phenomenon in any body of water. So yeah. I can't think of anything specific. No, that would just be detriment. Now you, you, the stress and all that, there may be a few things out there, but nothing that you can say, yeah, this happens every year and it's hard on them. Yeah. So it's just one of those things. If the water's four foot up and they bring it four foot down, those bass just naturally move, they reposition and it's your job to go figure out where they've repositioned to. And even if you find them, sometimes they're just not going to cooperate. Like yeah. fish are a strange creature in that fact that like, yeah. There's some some days they just don't want to yeah. play. I don't understand yeah, they, it. I wish they, I could understand yeah. that part. If I did, we'd all be better. That's right. We'd, we'd all be – nobody would be special. Now they get locked jaw pretty easily. And, and from that standpoint, absolutely, those drawdowns can affect them, you know. Yeah. But I, I don't know if it affects their health. I really – I mean, it's just I don't really know, but I just can't think of anything to say that it, it would. It would. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. And that's kind of always the – the side I aired on, you know what I mean? Like I doubt it's affecting their health because there's too many, they're too healthy. There's too many of these lakes that fluctuate up and down and, you know, you, know, you can go still catch four pounders. It, it, you got a little, I see a little buddy. Was that, was he get your, is that a cat there? Or is that a dog? I would say it's my wife's cat. It's and your it was wife's trying cat. to crawl up on my lap and I really yeah. don't like it that well, but for some <laughs> reason it thinks that I'm its owner or its caretaker. And oh, my, come on, John, you got to love on a little bit, buddy. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I typically tolerate it, but my wife and daughter are at the Elton John concert, in Thompson Bowling right now. There you go. So there's nobody here to take care come of the cat. John, so he he's just trying to me. sing to you. He hold me closer, Tony Danza. I mean, come on, you know what I mean? So he's just wanting you to hold him, man. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. But um, all right, so let's dive into the last one. And I, this kind of steps away from what kills bass. But I think that this is a question that we all have, and I've I've have my I have my theories on it backed up by things that I've read, and I'm sure you have your more factual statements on it because you're a lot smarter man than I am when it comes to this kind of stuff. Do bass feel pain? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. And my old supervisor, who's retired now, Doug Peterson, and he was a pioneer in kind of this stuff when he was in grad school. All right. Because it, it was a thing then, and he he uh, is a great mentor, and I, I miss him. I miss him daily. Yeah. Uh, but to answer that question, the the physiological part of the brain, and I think I'm using that term correctly. In other words, scientists think that fish don't have the part of the brain to feel pain. Now, is do they react to the stimulus 100 mm -hmm. percent? Pain in humans is usually tied to an emotion. You know, mm -hmm. we cry, we have this fear, we have panic, whatever you want to call it. And fish don't have that part of the brain that activates to cause any kind of response like that. It's not fear or pain. It's a, I need to do this to survive. I need to get mm -hmm. away. Self-preservation. Yeah, there you go. Self-preservation. So, you know, you can catch the same fish literally within minutes after it's been caught. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So whatever it's, it's experienced, if it's real pain, how we would experience it, they don't learn from it like we would. Mm. Now, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, it's not cruel to do whatever to a fish, but, but technically speaking, they do not have the part of the brain to feel pain as we know it. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's kind of based on what I've read, you know, that's kind of this, they just said it just doesn't, they don't got that part and in, in two, they don't rationalize. And so right. it's like where we would rationalize a pain with an emotion, like you said, a bass isn't going to rationalize in a pain with an emotion because mm -hmm probably they're not feeling it in the first place. And second of all, they, they can't rationalize because they're creatures, they're animals, they're, they're, yeah. unlike, they're unlike us. But they do react, and it's just more self-preservation. It's, I feel a pressure pulling me this way. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go that way, and so I'm mm -hmm. going to try to go this other direction to get away from this thing, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think in any instance is a very natural response. I mean, you know, through a fish's development and through, you know, through its adaptation to its environment, you know, when an eagle grabs it, it don't want that eagle pulling it out of the water. Just like when we drive a hook into its face, it yeah. doesn't want us pulling it out of the water. It's that unsafe. It's that unnatural yeah. thing. I mean, and yeah. so it's just a natural reaction for them to go the other direction. It has yeah, nothing they're... to do with, ouch, oh my God, I got to get away yes. from this. It's That's more, right. it's more, I have to preserve myself mm -hmm. because whatever this is, is trying to pull me in a direction mm -hmm. that I'm not wanting to go. Right. There's nerve endings, you know, and, and it's a response to that nerve nerve ending stimulus to, to yeah. do, to like you say, self-preservation. And, you know, uh, any animal's goal is to get its gene to the next generation. And if they have pain or a re response to a nerve stimulus, you know, it's doing the same thing. So yeah, you know, whether it's pain, we don't know, but apparently they don't have that, that uh, part, of the brain. part of the brain. Yeah. Interesting. When we look at a bass's brain, what is, what's, uh, I think we've talked about this before and it's when we got on the whole scent topic because I am now fascinated with everything scent. I actually started working with Berkeley, uh, back in June. And so I've got to dabble with all the scent technology and I've seen a noticeable difference in fish catches using yeah. max scent and there's something to it, right? But when we look yeah. at a bass's brain, the, the physiology of a bass's brain, the structure of a bass's brain, like our brain is is broken up into segments that do different things. And, you know, some segments do more, some segments do less. What is a bass's brain primarily dedicated to in just day-to-day -day life? Yeah. I, I mean, I really don't know. I, uh, you know, you kind of alluded to it earlier. It's a, you know, like, it lives its life in a world we don't even understand. And so there's, there's gotta be part of that in that answer, but I, I really don't know, you know, what, what it, I mean, it's so small and it's just, it's all instinctive behavior. And again, it's, you know, an animal in the wild, its goal is to get its gene to the next generation and everything it does is, is to, to do that and yeah. survive and reproduce. And so, that little tiny brain and that animal, that simple of an animal is geared to do that. And yeah. so you know, I really don't know what all those processes are like, but. So it is just essentially, and I, and I say this a whole lot, it's about self-preservation yeah. and the passing on of genes. And so whatever stimulus is fed into that bass's little, you know, thumbnail mm -hmm. size brain that they have, mm -hmm. that stimulus is going to dictate how that bass needs to act on any given moment in its existence for self-preservation and yeah. the passing on of the genes. And I mean, yeah. pretty much that is eating, yeah. pooping and making babies, <laughs> like in not getting yeah, killed. Pretty much. Yeah. It. Yeah, yeah. Not getting killed. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's experiments that even like with pet fish and goldfish, I mean, you can learn and yeah. you can teach them things, you know, but again, it's, it's part of what helps them survive and, and, be able to move their genes to the next generation. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is the ability that's, to learn. Yeah. And, and, and that's fascinating. And I do believe fish learn. I mean, I, I definitely think that when you start looking at older class fish, when you start looking at bigger fish, you start seeing smarter fish. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a very weird statement to say when you're talking about a, an animal that we literally just described as something, it's totally driven off instinct that doesn't yeah. feel pain that can't rationalize. Yeah. But it it is that it's it is a it's a a memory or a, a whatever the the mm -hmm. you know, it's a stimulus input that put a bad taste in the fish's mouth. Yeah. 
<laughs> and that yeah. stimulus input putting a bad fish in Tasty's mouth was enough to instinctually encode something into its existence right. to avoid that bad stimulus again. Right. And, right. and you know, one thing that I see a lot of is like, especially in rivers, especially in creeks, because that's where I like to fish, is I see a lot of fish who start to learn. And it's because I think a lot of those fish are very residential and I don't think a lot of them move a whole ton. No, and like when you get in shallow water, you have a population of fish that lives in that shallow water. And there's some that come in, there's some that come out. But for the most part, it's those same, let's say 150 mm -hmm. fish in a 200 yard stretch. And the reason I know that is because I've caught a lot of them two or three times and they've got hook marks in their roof of their mouth. And like I showed you the picture of the one that I caught, they've got marks on their gills, things yeah. that are very indicative that that's the same fish. Yeah. And, you know, first it was first it was trolling motors. They quit liking trolling motors. Well, then I switched to a kayak. Well, then they quit liking normal Cinco, so I had to go to Berkeley Max Scent, you know, yeah. Generals. And, yeah. and hopefully they don't ever get, uh, you know, tired of the, the General. And, you know, it was it's weird. It's like they used to want to eat a, a freak color Spro Frog. Now they only want to eat a all-black color yeah. Spro Frog. And it's weird crap like that that, you know, to me, I go, man, that is just my – weird anecdotal experience me overthinking this mm -hmm. but the no, more you right. think but the more you think about it, these fish do inherently come become conditioned to things yeah. and because it's a bad stimulus and because self-preservation is the number one thing on an instinctual drive of a fish they mm -hmm. avoid that's right and, and and a good example of that is the alabama rig if, if you know just not too many years ago a lot of people thought and you know us included that oh, this is going to just kill the population but they got used to it pretty quickly and now it's just like any other lure i mean it works great but not as effective as it did when it first came out oh yeah i mean when it first came out you know people were catching five six fish on it as many hooks as you could get on it they were catching yeah. especially when they were schooling and now man they avoid you yeah. know and, it, and, and it's going to take something truly revolutionary yeah. and i think i think that's why we see and this is we're going to get in some real angler talk here I think that's why we see these Japanese anglers. So right now on Chickamauga, they're having the Elite Series event. Mm -hmm. The guy who's in second place is a Japanese angler. Okay. And that guy's bringing baits. He's bringing techniques. He's bringing presentations. He's bringing line diameters. He's bringing things that these fish have literally never seen, and, they're, and he's using it. And the Japanese are the perfect example of a group of people who are constantly having to revolutionize because of the amount of fishing pressure in Japan. And you yeah. got Lake Biwa and a couple other smaller lakes, but you got millions of people fishing that one lake. Mm -hmm. And yep. so that's why you see these crazy baits. Like I seen one today. It was crazy. And I'll send you the video of it after we get off here. It was a, it was literally a square block of plastic with a bunch of little arms off of it. It looked like a sea urchin and the mm -hmm. guy would run a hook up through it. And I mean, he was hammering bass on it and it's because it's just something those bass, it's it is a, it's a stimulus they've never seen. Yeah. And if there's one certainty that live scope showed us or, you know, fishing unique baits has showed us is that when you show a fish something that it doesn't normally see, they are very curious and they mm -hmm. will come investigate. And if it looks like something they can kill, they're going to kill it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I had the fascinating experience the other day. I was up in a creek, way up in a creek, like, you know, doing some tin rig stuff where, you know, only you can take an aluminum boat. And I actually had a spotted bass that swam up to the boat. And when he figured out, oh, God, that thing's a lot bigger than I am, he swam away. But I saw him swim off the bank. And I think it's just because that spotted bass, I don't think it ever experienced anything like me. And it yeah. was like, what is this? And then it was like, yeah. oh, God, that's too big. I got to get away from it. Yeah. But it's it's very curious to see, just kind of going back on what I was talking about, like these guys from Japan are being very, very successful. Successful cool. to the point in a – 150 angler field there's been a japan a guy from japan who can barely speak english mind you that has come in and won an elite series event last year won an elite series event the year before we got one who's in second place and has the potential to win an elite series event this year yeah, so that nice. tells you that out of this very 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 small percentage of the guys who are actually elite series anglers there's an even smaller percentage in like one or two guys that are japanese that are presenting fish with something that's so completely different that they're willing yeah. to eat it. That's cool. So, yeah. It's really cool. It's really cool. Well, listen, John, dude, I appreciate you so much. I know I tell you that every time we get on here, but I really do appreciate you. You are a, uh, 
You're an awesome human being. You're one of my favorite people to talk to because you are super smart and I enjoy your uh, your willingness to share your intelligent but intelligence. But I think we're going to call it done because we've been on here an hour and 40 minutes and I don't want to waste any more of your time or take up any more of your time. But um, tell people I, before we get off here, we still got quite a few people in here. I, how's the, the how's the pork, uh, the pork smoking business going and tell people about that so we can get you some more business. Oh, it, we our business is fine. We uh, actually are going to be cooking some next week for Easter. We usually do it around uh, major holidays and uh, it's it's going like it should. Our, our daughter's 16 and she helped me put together a TikTok and it has somewhere around a million views. So she calls it her flex where. She gets to tell people that she's got a TikTok with a million views. So there you go. There you yeah, go. but I guess that's our biggest claim to fame right now. But no, it's going good. I appreciate you mentioning. It. I wanted to say too, I enjoy being on here, and I don't take it for granted that I get the opportunity to talk to people interested in what we do, and and the folks that who bought come to Tennessee or in Tennessee that buy a license, I do appreciate it, and even yep. the folks that are not in Tennessee that buy those. Um, those uh, lures and rods uh, at least some percentage of that winds up going to all states. And, and I don't take that for granted. I, I love what I do. And without, without those folks, I wouldn't be here or be able to talk to you. So I do appreciate that. Absolutely, man. And I, and I appreciate those people as well, because I think um, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate you as an individual, obviously TWRA, TWRA is a, is an organization and I think that all of us as anglers, all of us as hunters, anybody who is a steward of, public water public land um i think as a whole we're underappreciated but i think appreciating each other yes. and and really supporting each other and helping to grow the sports what's gonna it's it's gonna be to the betterment of all of us it's my Absolutely. my grandchildren's grandchildren i hope they get to catch bass and the only way that that hope turns into a certainty is if we keep having these conversations and getting out here and let people know about it so uh, absolutely so well I think we're going to end it right here. Everybody that listened on podcast form, we appreciate you listening. Everybody that tuned in tonight on the live, we appreciate you guys. And as always, you guys are sweet, and we will see you next week.